Good afternoon uh, and uh, good evening. Um, I'm Magda Terra, I'm the Schwidler Chair in Judaic Studies, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's event, the Salah Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies series, which will feature Sarah Zager. In 2017, we launched a pilot program of postdoctoral fellowships, the Rabin Schwidler Postdoctoral Fellowship with Columbia University um, and its Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies. The result of this program has been a lecture series, the Salah Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies, which spotlights outstanding emerging scholars in Jewish studies. This semester, uh, aside from uh, today's event with Sarah, we'll hear um, four other, three other scholars, uh, including our Rabin Schwiller postdoctoral fellow. They will share their work, uh, like Sarah today, on Jewish ethics, on Jewish identity in 20th century Iran, on Ars Poetica and Israeli, Russian Israeli poets, and on Hasidic diamond brokers' economic theology. So I hope you'll join us for this series and we'll look out for, uh, for information about those events. Today's speaker is Sarah Zager. She's a PhD candidate in religious studies and philosophy at Yale University. Her dissertation entitled, I Will Think of Love and Justice, Jewish Responses to Virtue Ethics, uh, explores how Jewish philosophers have combined deontological and virtue ethical approaches to morality. She's also beginning to work on her second project, which is tentatively titled, The Pain of Imagining Others, Infertility and Care, which explores how Jews, Jewish sources can help theorize experiences of infertility, infertility. Before I turn the screen over to our speaker, Sarah Zager, I wanted to express my gratitude to those who made this event possible. Shavan Verletza has made sure that we all received our Zoom links and information about today's event. I am also grateful to the Salo uh, Wittmeyer Baron, uh, Salo Baron I'm sorry, Sarah and Janet Baron Foundation and the Knapp Family Foundation, which have funded the, Bar the Sala Baron New Voices series. I also want to express my thanks to you for joining us and being part of our learning community, um, for your interest in our offerings and, um, and joining us on weekly programs and reading our newsletter. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to our next event, also on Wednesday, next Wednesday on February 16th, but at 6 p.m., um, historian Jonathan Ned Katz would, will speak with our colleague Karina Martin Hogan about his new book, The Daring Life of, uh, and Dangerous Times of Eve Adams, about the daring Jewish immigrant lesbian life of Eve Adams, an Eastern European and Jewish woman who came to America, changed her name, became um, involved in radical politics and then was deported and ended up uh, dying in Auschwitz. Uh, so that's next week. I will send you information about this event in the chat. The chat um, is uh, only one directional. I will send you the information about events. Uh, please feel free to ask questions, post questions and comments in the Q&A section of the screen. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me now turn over the screen to Sarah. Sarah, the screen is yours. Hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really excited to share some of my work with you today. So with that, I'm going to share my screen um, for the PowerPoint. And maybe uh, Magda or, or Siobhan, you could just let me know whether it has worked correctly. It seems like it has. It seems, seems good. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll get started. In the, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as recent political debates surrounding the economic undervaluing of the work of those, for who, those who care for American society's most vulnerable, have led American political discourse to focus new attention on care and caregiving. And while this can seem like a new set of questions, especially given the speed at which American political life now proceeds, the social and ethical significance of care has been a philosoph has a philosophical history that extends back at least several decades. 
Beginning in the 1980s, feminist philosophers argued that existing visions of ethics, especially Kantian ones, tended to focus on an abstract individual who was not enmeshed in caring relationships with others. This, they argued, left ethics ill-equipped to understand the kinds of care work that disproportionately devolved and still devolve on women. So to address this problem, feminist philosophers argued for an ethics of care, which would treat human relationships of care and vulnerability as fundamental features of human experience. Especially in the 1990s, this work had a sort of optimistic tone. Care ethicists thought that getting the philosophy right would address the persistent social and economic undervaluing of care work. Three or so decades since, you can see that our work remains cut out for us. Women continue to do a disproportionate share of household work and childcare labor. And these disparities have become only more profound during the COVID-19 pandemic. Other forms of care for the most vulnerable also remain significantly undervalued with home health care workers often struggling to earn a livable wage. Efforts to address this problem, both on a local level in New York State, where these problems are some of the most profound in the country, and on a national stage, have struggled to gain meaningful political traction. From the early 1980s through to the, the beginning of the 2000s, care ethicists trying to convince American philosophers and thus American society more broadly that we are not okay with the current situation. But I, as I hope I've already made clear, there remains a great deal of work, both philosophical and political, to be done. Care ethics promise in general philosophical circles has receded significantly in recent decades. But at the same time, it's gained renewed interest as a tool for thinking about the intersection of gender and Jewish thought. In the past several years, scholars in Jewish studies have explored how Jewish ethicists can learn from the kinds of care work often performed by women. Andrea Dara Cooper's book, Gendering Modern Jewish Thought, has argued that Jewish thought can benefit from increased attention to sisterhood rather than the brotherhood relations that dominate many key works in modern Jewish ethics. Michal Rauscher's 2020 book, Conceiving Agency, Reproductive Authority Among Haredi Women, has argued that women develop forms of embodied knowledge, which they use to navigate patriarchal and re religious and medical systems. And Mary Benjamin's landmark book, The Obligated Self, Maternal Subjectivity in Jewish Thought, suggests that the concept of chiyuv, or obligation, is best understood through the lens of a mother's obligation to care for her child. This scholarship has made significant strides toward treating women's caregiving experiences as sites of ethical knowledge and as material for scholarly analysis. Overall, my research seeks to push this scholarship to consider a wider range of experiences of care than have been treated either in canonical texts in modern Jewish ethics or in this recent burgeoning of scholarship on motherhood. So to facilitate this, I work to diagnose why some experiences have been left out of this scholarship and to develop a new set of theoretical tools for understanding how appeals to particular experiences work and sometimes don't work in the context of ethical projects. So today I wanna to explore some of the possibilities and challenges that confront contemporary Jewish thoughts engagement with care ethics. To do this, I'm gonna focus on one key conceptual move that both general care ethics and Jewish, Jewish attempts to talk with or through care ethics use, the argument that philosophy or Jewish thought is too abstract to really understand and address the important ethical issues we face in everyday life. I'm interested in these critiques of abstraction, not only because of their philosophical shape, but because of the ethical promise that they often make to us. By claiming that the philosophy that came before is too abstract to get at the real details of our lives, these theories also promise us a new version of philosophy that is more attentive to the things that cause us pain and joy and that demand our attention and our labor. These critiques of abstraction are thus the conceptual tools that are supposed to make possible care of this political and social intervention. In its Jewish guise, this scholarship also promises to give us a philosophy that better understands what it's like to live as a Jew who wants to engage with the modern world. So today I'm gonna to use a comparison of critiques of abstraction and key texts in care ethics 
and in Mary Benjamin's obligated self in order to identify some key features facing efforts to engage, some key challenges, sorry, facing, facing efforts to engage care ethics in Jewish thought. So I'll begin with an outline of the ways that care ethicists have critiqued abstraction, showing that this critique is actually shaped by anti-Jewish rhetoric, which rejects Judaism as problematically disembodied and focused on rules. Next, I'll show how Benjamin's own critique of abstraction in the obligated self offers some tools for addressing this problem, though I'll show that more work remains to be done in order to build a version of care ethics that can be at home in Jewish thought. And I'll conclude by suggesting that abstractions might actually be helpful for a Jewish engagement with care ethics, and that they might even allow Jewish thought to contribute substantively to care ethics' conceptual vocabulary. So on to this first step, outlining care ethical critiques of abstraction. Care ethics is often said to begin with the publication of psychologist Carol Gilligan's book, In a Different Voice, in 1982. There, Gilligan argued that men and women have different moral voices in which they describe and analyze the world. Women, she argues, are more likely to use the voice of care rather than the voice of justice, i.e. they're more likely to ask, what can I do to help this person than what is fair or what is just? While the psychology community has raised significant questions about Gilligan's methodology, her overall insight has led to the development of a whole field of philosophical inquiry focused on the question, what would it look like to do philosophy using the voice of care? So today I'm gonna to focus on two texts that take that the basic paradigm that Gilligan articulated and shift it into a philosophical key. The first is Nell Nottings' Caring, a Relational Approach to Ethics and Moral Education, which was published in 1984. And the second is Virginia Held's Ethics of Care, Personal, Political, and Global, published in 2005. Nonnings' work is one of the foundational texts in care ethics and represents one of the first works translating some of Gilligan's key claims into explicitly philosophical terms. Held's Ethics of Care serves in part as a summary of where the field has been in the intervening 21 years. It seeks to put care ethics on the map as an ethical theory in its own right, with something to say to a broad audience in both philosophical ethics and political theory. Both of these works offer a critique of abstraction, which contains two main elements. First, a critique of the ways that existing ethical theories depend on abstract formulations of rules or obligations. And second, a critique of the abstract philosophical anthropology, i.e. a philosophical picture of what a human being is, that they take to be dominant in existing philosophical theories. I hope to show today that both of these elements of the critique of abstraction present significant challenges for Jewish thought. So on to this first part, uh, the critique of, ab of abstract moral rules or concepts of obligation. When Held and Noddings were writing, many of the most prominent ethical theories focused on moral rules that they thought supposedly apply to everyone. And the main debates in moral philosophy tended to be about how we could derive, formulate, and apply these rules. Noddings and Held then suggest that this form of rule-based ethics, sometimes called deontology, relies on a problematic abstraction. Thus, as Held puts it, one of the central goals of the ethics of care is to call into question the universalistic and abstract rules of the dominant theories. Nottings goes further than held to say that rule following is actually antithetical to caring. According to Nottings, if someone is, say, visiting a friend in a hospital because they're following a moral rule, then the care that they provide to that friend is somehow undermined. She writes, to care is not to act by fixed rule, but by affection and regard. Rule bond responses in the name of caring lead us to suspect that the claimant wants most to be credited with caring. For Noddings, to do something in the name of a moral rule is to do it in, in a way that isn't really genuine. It's just interested in checking a box or getting credit for following the relevant rule. This statement by Nonnings already points to one of the potential problems we might face if we try to adapt care ethics as a tool for Jewish thought. Care ethicists often express significant discomfort at the general notion of obligation and the rules that many concepts of obligation engender, 
Jewish thought, in contrast, tends to treat obligation as both the very as the very basis both of religious life and moral life, even if lots of Jewish thinkers have diverse ideas about what those obligations actually are. So for both held and noddings, this rejection of moral rules is gendered. For both of them, there's something distinctly feminine about the rejection of moral rules. Held writes that, quote, women's experience has typically included cultivating relationships with family and friends. Affectionate sensitivity and responsiveness to need may seem to provide better moral guidance than abstract rules or calculations of individual utilities. Similarly, Nonnings argues that treating ethics as a system of rules is fundamentally opposed to the feminine approach to ethics. She writes, this approach through law and principle is not, I suggest, the approach of the mother. It is the approach of the detached one, of the father. The view expressed here, i.e. in her book, is a feminine view. It is feminine in the deep classical sense, rooted in receptivity, relatedness, and responsiveness. Recent work in both psychology and gender studies has critiqued the kind of gender essentialism that held and nodding views here quite extensively. And I won't rehearse these critiques here, but for the moment, it's sufficient to note that for Noddings and Held, the rejection of abstract moral rules is assumed to create space for a distinctly feminine moral voice to emerge. In order to pursue this feminist agenda, Held and Noddings then offer a critique of the philosophical anthropology that they find in standard ethical theories. In order to understand their arguments, it's helpful to have a sense of the position that they're arguing against. Many key political philosophers in the modern period, modern period very broadly defined, focused on an imagined citizen whose particular attachments to family members or others were abstracted away and replaced with attachments to the state or the political order. In a passage that feminist philosophers love to hate, the political philosopher Thomas Hobbes writes that, quote, let us consider men as if but even now sprung out of the earth and suddenly like mushrooms come to full maturity without any kind of engagement with each other. While this statement from Hobbes can sound a little silly, it's worth work seeing how this view has, that this view has had some advantages. The shift away from emphasizing a per person's particular history and lineage allows philosophers to articulate a universal notion of human value that they can apply to all people. But for held and noddings, this approach creates a problem. The notion of universal value that these philosophers use can't make sense of the particular relationships that parents have with their children. This leads Held to write that, quote, what a parent may value in her child may well not be what makes this child like every other, but the very particularity of the child and of the relationship that exists between them, such that she is the mother and mother of this child and this particular person is her child. So rather than focus on an individual who's abstracted away from the people who provided for her care, Helda Noddings double down on the particularity of parent-child relationships and make this particularity the defining feature of what it means to be a human being. For both Noddings and Held, the paradigmatic particular relationship is the one between a biological mother and her child. Often the first moment of the new biological mother holding her child is used as the key vignette which illustrates what constitutes a genuinely particular relationship. Held writes that, quote, the feeling a parent of a newborn may have that this child is the center of the universe and that there is nothing more important in all the world is not only a temporary emotional distortion that will soon be modified, something that other philosophers had argued in various ways. For both Noddings and Held, the sense of mindness of this child is defined biologically. In her discussion of abortion, Noddings writes that under most circumstances, it makes sense to treat a fetus as an information speck, which does not have the same status as a human life. However, she argues that, oh, sorry, um, she argues that that ethical situation changes significantly when the information speck becomes mine, 
Importantly for our purposes, this happens when the mother contemplates the traits that the child might inherit from its biological parents. She writes, but suppose the information spec is mine and I am aware of it. This child to be is the product of love between a man deeply cared for and me. She assumes all kinds of heteronormativity, which are which is problematic. Um, while will a child have his eyes or mine, his stature or mine, our joint love of mathematics or his love of mechanics or my love of language? This is not just an information spec. It is endowed with prior love and current knowledge. It is joined to loved others through formal chains of caring. The mother-fetus relationship Nottings describes here has a social, cognitive, and emotional component. But when this relationship is present, its significance is interpreted through the woman's musings about heritable traits. Nottings writes that th this being becomes sacred and not an information spec because we can wonder whether the child will have his eyes or mine. So here, Noddings grounds her ethical claim, not in actual acts of care that a parent performs for the child, but in the biology that she takes to be representative of that relationship. In the end though, actual lived experiences of care have receded into the background. This is not so much an ethics of care as it is an ethics of heritability. Nodding's affirmation of embodied particularity makes frequent use of religious terminology, images, and concepts, and draws significantly on anti-Jewish tropes. Her reliance on this conceptual vocabulary helps us recognize some of the dangers and the kinds of critiques of abstraction we see in both her work and in Held's. At several points in the book, Nodding turns to the biblical story of the binding of Isaac, in Genesis 22, using it to contrast what she calls the ethical approach of the father, i.e. Abraham, and the mother. The difference between these two ethical approaches then produces two different theologies. She writes, under the gaze of an abstract and untouchable God, Abraham would destroy this touchable child whose real eyes were turned upon him in trust and love and fear. I suspect no woman could have written either Genesis or Fear and Trembling. The one caring, male or female, does not seek security in abstractions cast either as principles or entities. There's an implicit incarnational theology in Nodding's language here. The paradigmatic mother's natural relatedness leads her to demand a God that is not abstract and untouchable, but instead touchable and particular. Nodding's also implicitly associates this abstract and untouchable God with a God who issues commands or laws. This abstract God's frequent insistence on obedience to rules and adherence to ritual contributes to the erosion of genuine caring. In contrast, care ethics, Nodding's thinks, eschews legal formulations. She writes that care ethics does not attempt to reduce the need for human judgment with a series of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Rather, it allows for situations and conditions in which judgment in the impersonal logical sense may be properly put aside in favor of faith and commitment. In this way, nodding suggests that someone focused on natural caring must not have the kind of abstract theological approach she associates with Abraham. And in addition, that person must not endorse the idea that any God, incarnational or otherwise, could issue moral rules or commands. As we'll see, sources in Jewish thought challenge the link between natural caring and the rejection of deontic divine commands, instead arguing for both a strong sense of obligation and attention to embodied acts of care. This rhetoric has a long history. The very these very critiques were frequently leveled against Jews and Judaism generally. Strikingly, Nodding's critique of Abraham closely tracks Hegel's critique of Abraham as articulated in his early theological writings. Hegel identifies many of the same flaws in Abraham that Nodding's finds in the name of woman. Hegel claims that by sacrificing his son, Abraham snaps the bonds of communal life and love. This leads Hegel to offer a broad critique of Judaism in general. In his essay, The Moral Teachings of Jesus, Hegel claims that Judaism forces its adherents to prioritize the universal over the particular in a way that hinders loving relationships. 
for the particular impulses, inclinations, pathological love, sensuous experience, or whatever else it is called, the universal is necessary and always something alien and objective. Noddings too argues that the universal, whether a purportedly universal God or a supposedly universal set of moral rules, represents an unwelcome intrusion into the natural and particular relationships of care. The ethical voice of Noddings' woman is not actually as distinctive then as she claims. Against the backdrop of Hegel's arguments about Abraham, we can see that the ethical voice of Nottings' woman bears a striking similarity to that of a 19th century German philosopher. As I indicated at the outset, in recent years, there's been growing interest in engaging care ethics in a Jewish context. Jewish versions of care ethics often take a distinctive shape and adopt particular versions of care ethics' critique of abstraction. These differences may be explained, at least in part, by the implicit influence of the theological background I've just discussed. So here I want to outline two main differences between the care ethical arguments I've just, I've just surveyed and their Jewish counterparts. First, Jewish articulations of care ethics tend to be less hostile to notions of moral obligation and moral rules. While, as we saw above, contemporary ethicists, care ethicists tend to treat these rules as problematically abstract, Jewish versions of care ethics, ethics tend to take halachic rules as one of their fundamental concepts and thus view moral rules as initially always particularized. Second, th these versions of care ethics focus less on the notion of a natural or genetic connection between people as a mark of particularity. The first distance difference should not surprise us. As Benjamin notes in the opening line of her book, quote, to be a Jew, according to the classical textual tradition, is to be obligated. Given Judaism's heavy emphasis on deontological concepts like chiyuv, obligation, mitzvah, commandment, it makes sense then that Jewish care ethicists have been less willing to jettison moral concepts like obligations and rules. But the second of these departures might actually seem a little bit ironic. Jewish culture and religion retain significant emphasis on biological relationships and on the importance of a particular, though rather large, family group the Jewish people, which often places significant emphasis on endogamy and whose characteristic marker of communal belonging is a physical embodied ritual. While some modern Jewish thinkers have sought to distance themselves from this genetic notion of peoplehood, others have embraced it. The Weimar Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig famously describes Judaism as a blood community. In this sense, the version of the embodied natural connection that held and Nottings prioritized could actually help make sense of a stream of Jewish religious thought, which often makes Jewish ethicists and theologians nervous, perhaps even articulating it in a feminist key. But by and large, Jewish care ethicists have not pursued this line of thinking. Part of that might be explained by contingent features of the experiences of some Jewish care ethicists. Benjamin's book recounts two distinct experiences of maternal subjectivity, one with her biological daughter and one with her partner's biological daughter, whom she had to legally adopt, quote unquote, because of the legal restrictions on queer families at the time. Thus, Benjamin's own life experience may prime her to reject Nodding's and Held's emphasis on natural relationships of care. Comparing her two experiences of entering parenthood leads Benjamin to remark that, quote, the difference between becoming a mother through legal bureaucratic means and becoming a mother by virtue of giving birth raised for me an unexpected question. Why didn't I have to take on the responsibility of being a mother to my biological daughter voluntarily, publicly, of my own accord, as I had with my non-biological daughter? By asking this question, Benjamin implicitly asks whether natural care might not be primary at all. It's just one of the ways that a person could come to be an obligated self who's engaged in a relationship of parental care. As we saw above, one of the main intuitions driving classical care ethicists' worries about institutions, rules, and law is that these social practices privilege the universal and the abstract over the particular. 
However, Benjamin is able to find strong, particularized forms of care, even in relationships that are marked by these forces. As Benjamin notes, both of her children, and not just her biological one, placed her under some form of obligation, which was highly particularized. She writes, to be an obligated self was to be subject to the law of another, the law of the baby. The law could not be fulfilled in abstract, but only in active embodied material actions, soothing, feeding, cleaning, comforting, distracting, smiling, and wiping. The law of the baby was not the law of any baby, but rather the law of this baby. In this way, Benjamin is able to retain the sense that there is something about this baby which stakes a claim on me without saying that this relationship of particularized care and therefore this sense of obligation is based on the law of my baby, where the sense of mine is dependent on a so-called natural relationship between the biological mother and the child. Far from rejecting the notion of rules or laws as incompatible with the particular needs of an individual child, Benjamin finds law to be a useful metaphor for describing these demands. Benjamin's emphasis on the particularized experience of caring for this baby leads her to retain many of the same assumptions about the problems with abstract moral reasoning that we saw in Held and Noddings. Benjamin critiques abstract philosophical anthropology deployed by canonical figures, not in ethical theory, but in modern Jewish thought, including Franz Rosenzweig, Hermann Cohen, and Emmanuel Levinas. She offers a more specific critique of the philosophical anthropology that these thinkers deploy in their arguments. Like modern Jewish thinkers before me, Benjamin argues, I find relationships theologically productive. However, my best known 20th century predecessors assumed adult male subjects imagined relationships in highly stylized terms, and even turned daily life or everydayness into a philosophical abstraction. Here, Benjamin identifies one of the key ways that attempts to theorize lived experience can go wrong. If we set out to theorize daily life and we restrict ourselves to the stylized terms, or less charitably, we might say obscurantist philosophical jargon used by these canonical figures, we will end up turning daily life or even the particular into a nameless abstraction. The end result of this move, Benjamin argues, is a theory that claims to be about the everyday, but is actually not interested in everyday experiences like waiting in line at the grocery store. Benjamin uses this turn to particularity to motivate the central argumentative move of her book, an analogy between maternal obligation and halachic obligation. Benjamin follows both held and noddings in arguing that maternal experience is always particularized and embodied. But as we saw earlier, she highlights the role of obligation in maternal experience, and she does not place the same emphasis on heredity. Benjamin then uses, the, then argues that halakhic obligation shares these features. It too is particularized, i.e. demands specific actions to be carried out by a specific group of people at particular times. These actions are often embodied. You have to put this strap on your arm. And like parenthood, halakhic obligation can be entered into via both birth and conversion. Understanding halakhic obligation in terms of maternal obligation, Benjamin argues, makes it easier to make sense of the idea that God obligates human beings to do particular embodied actions. Thus, Benjamin writes that if God is not only a loving parent, but a demanding baby, we may find within ourselves the resolve to meet the demand. By finding theological meaning in the law of the baby, Benjamin hopes that we can find a new way to understand what it means to be obligated in mitzvot. Benjamin's emphasis on obligation, as well as her increased comfort with institutional structures that often create, obligation, create obligations and bolter, bolster relationships of care, represent significant departures from the care ethical tradition. But I want to suggest here that these two departures ought to motivate a third, a rejection, or at minimum, at least a significant revision of the critique of abstraction. So I wanna suggest that abstractions can be helpful in two main ways. First, 
they help expose the ways that scholars do conceptual work in describing lived experiences. And second, they help us expand the range of experiences that we can understand as care by including experiences that themselves involve abstractions. My analysis thus far has suggested that critiques of abstraction, especially ones articulated in a philosophical idiom, can sometimes be ambivalent. In order to identify the difference between the bad abstract position that these critiques seek to reject and the particularity that they seek to affirm, these arguments often end up creating a new layer of abstract terminology. As Benjamin puts it, in Rosenzweig, Cohen, and Levinas, the individual becomes a kind of abstract other with no particular features. Similarly, in Benjamin's work, maternal experience becomes not not only a particular experience had by this mother and this baby, but also a conceptual framework. And it's this conceptual treatment of maternal subjectivity that drives Benjamin's analogization of maternal obligation and halakhic obligation. One might read this as a sort of self-contradiction. Abstraction is critiqued and then deployed almost in the same breath. But I think there's a deeper and more interesting problem here as well. The critique of abstraction actually makes it harder to recognize the important conceptual work that feminist projects like Benjamin's are doing. Benjamin's sensitive conceptual treatment of maternal obligation represents a significant contribution to the decades long feminist effort to develop conceptual vocabulary to address experiences that the philosophical tradition, both Jewish and otherwise, has tended to ignore. But recognizing that this work is conceptual, that it creates and deploys abstractions, helps correct the longstanding assumption that care work, especially mothering, is somehow antithetical to thinking. Once we see that part of what Benjamin is doing in the obligated self is developing a conceptual account of what maternal experience is, then we're in a better position to see what kinds of experiences that account can make sense of and which it cannot. Doing this analysis allows us to imagine how halakhic obligation might be differently conceived if we change what we included on the other side of the analogy. As I argued a few minutes ago, care ethical reflection both inside and outside of Jewish studies has used the encounter between a parent, usually a mother, and a young child as the paradigmatic example of care. In my research, I work to expand the range of experiences that we can treat as experiences of care, including experiences of parental care, to account for the ways that care can sometimes be directed at an abstract rather than a particularized other. I'm interested in the ways that experiences of infertility can be understood as experiences of care. This is the case, especially today, when experiences of infertility often through the course of medical treatment require specific embodied actions in order to care for an other who remains abstract and not embodied, the hoped for child. Thus, a Jewish feminist ethics that treats a wider range of experiences, and not just the form of maternal obligation that Benjamin highlights in her descriptions of caring for her own young children, I think cannot askew abstractions. Instead, it needs to account for the ways that abstractions play a role in particularized embodied experiences, including experiences of maternal care, but truly not only those. As I continue working on this project, I'm also exploring the ways that abstraction and care intersect in other experiences. I'm interested in the ways that abstractions allow us to analyze mourning as a form of care for the, for the memory of a specific person, even when that memory is no longer particularized in a specific body. Above, we saw, earlier, we saw how Nottings and Held relied on an assumed dichotomy between a disembodied ethics and an embodied ethics which in turn was rooted in a dichotomy between a disembodied and an embodied religion or theology. Now I wanna to turn to, I wanna show that Jewish texts can provide some useful resources for thinking beyond this dichotomy and to begin to develop an ethics which has room for both the kinds of embodied relationships of care for particular, for particular others that Nodding's held and Benjamin highlight while not excluding other forms of care which are, ba which are based on some form of abstraction. A rabbinic text discussing amulets thought to prevent miscarriage provides us with one useful set of images or metaphors for thinking through this form of abstract care. 
In general, rabbinic law prohibits carrying objects between public and private spaces on the Sabbath, though objects that are worn rather than carried are permitted. Thus, the Talmud includes a detailed discussion about what kinds of objects may be carried out on Shabbat. The rabbis consider whether a woman may go out with an object called a preservation stone, a kind of amulet thought to prevent miscarriage. Our rabbis taught, one may go out with, with a preservation stone on the Sabbath, according to Rabbi Meir. They said, even a counterweight to the preservation stone that has the same weight. And not only someone who has previously miscarried, but also in case the, in case the person does miscarry. And not only someone who is pregnant, but also in case the person becomes pregnant and miscarries. Abaye said, and what about a counterweight to a counterweight? Let this dilemma sound, stand unresolved. Abstraction enters into this text in two distinct phases. The rabbis begin by imagining an embodied act of care for an embodied fetus. There is a pregnant woman who needs to prevent the loss of this specific fetus by carrying this specific stone. Almost immediately though, the rabbis consider whether the stone could be replaced by another stone, which shares some physical properties with it, but is not in fact itself the preservation stone. It's just a stand-in, a kind of representation. And then they consider whether even a representation of that representation of the original stone might suffice. The rabbis also consider whether a woman might be allowed to carry the preservation stone, not in response to some embodied reality, i.e. an already conceived fetus or a lived history of past miscarriage, which might necessitate additional precautions, but also a situation where the woman might carry the stone for a hoped for but not yet realized pregnancy. The rabbis permit what would otherwise be a serious bi violation of biblical and rabbinic law in order to allow this woman to care for a pregnancy, which is not yet an embodied reality, but instead an imagined and hoped for presence. This is a surprising move given the other ways in which the rabbis tend to restrict women's bodies and sometimes refuse to trust women's own testimony about them. However, this kind of embodied care for an as yet abstract hope for reality is actually quite familiar to the rabbis in other places. Rabbinic imagination of future redemption of the Jewish people requires actually just this kind of embodied care. It requires physicalized, ritualized actions. But that reality itself, i.e. the sort of messianic redemption, remains only imagined and abstract. The Messiah can only be imagined and expected not yet pointed to as an embodied reality. Some medieval and modern Jewish thinkers took this as an invitation to imagine what future re redemption would look like in great detail, and even to imagine that some embodied actions in the world meaningfully concretize it. But they nonetheless recognize that these concretizations aim at an unrealized vision of the future. These concretizations too are sometimes described as mitzvot, responses to a command or a law. So on this view, law demands concrete action in the service of an abstractly construed, as yet unrealized, redemptive possibility. Like the kind of care that leads the woman to carry the preservation stone, this hope is sometimes quite distant from embodied lived reality. Both of these, are, these acts of care are experienced and expressed through specific embodied actions of care and devotion. The rabbis imagine that human beings can participate in the process of redemption in a variety of ways, including ritual performance of the mitzvot, caring for the sick, the widow, the orphan, and the poor. And these are actions carried out at specific times to address specific needs. But all of them are understood to be expressions of hope, and I want to suggest care, for an as yet abstract reality. In this way, a Jewish engagement with care ethics offers an opportunity not only to use care ethics as a framework for analyzing Jewish thought, but also to use Jewish thought to reconsider care, some of care ethics core conceptual moves. A Jewish engagement with care ethics then can help us understand how care is sometimes characterized by rather than antithetical to abstraction. Thank you very much. I'm eager to hear your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It was really very interesting, and I, um, I, uh, I am totally. It's totally out of my field. Uh, so I was jotting down my reactions to uh, to your 
your talk and um, most of it was entirely new to me um, in even the, the framing, the thinking. But one of the in sort of larger reaction I have that what you and the other um, Jewish uh, f female philosophers, if we're if if we have to classify it and and sort of mm -hmm. describe it in that, are doing is you are challenging. It's a critique of an unacknowledged sort of universalized. Christian framework of thinking, right? In even in the uh, question of abstraction, um, that is, uh, and it made me think uh, about how that idea of abstract and uh, by the male thinkers have really also contributed to the um, study of intellectual history is this disembodied field of ideas rather than mm -hmm embodied context historical kind of thought um, so what you seem to be doing is is bringing the ideas into the the embodied experience uh, in that in that way and i was really it was one of my first uh, reactions was the, the sort of christian framework that when you were discussing nothings i was really very happy to see how you unpacked it that Christian, uh, Christian, it's uh, you know, Christianity has has negated Judaism as uh, in its sort of framework of against works, against rules, uh, salvation by faith and abstraction, uh, effectively. In even though the God was embodied, right? There's this mm -hmm. this tension in in that that came through in your in your work. But it was interesting to see how these philosophers, whether the, um, you know, the earlier male philosophers or the uh, more recent women uh, have, have these mental habits that they almost don't acknowledge this Christian theological framework in which they produce and, uh, and presumably claim some universal philosophical um, ideas or, or, or that. So I wonder whether you could you know, maybe elaborate a little bit on that, uh, on, on, on that, on that uh, discussion on, on the, the larger, again, in your field of the larger Christian framework that is not acknowledged, that is universalized, and how um, both Jewish and women that do so well show, but perhaps other groups as well, are challenging that those uh, those mental habits and assumptions, and I invite everybody else to you know to uh, share your comments and and questions and the Q and A. Um, thank you for that that question. I think um, your intuitions are really right on. So just a few kind of threads to pick up on. There's sort of a few interlocking philosophical traditions, and when they cross, different kind of historical things are happening. So the first thing that's happening is a tendency in what we sometimes call anglophone or analytic philosophy, even not is isn't really an analytic philosopher, but she sort of talks to those people and held really thinks of herself as an analytic philosopher, um, which is a, a tradition that thinks of itself as secular and ahistorical and like wears the ahistorical bad with pride and excitement. Um, coming from Jewish studies that like makes makes my stomach sort of churn, but that's that's often how it kind of works. And for them, the idea that there are religious themes going on in philosophical categories, or as you described it, religious sort of habits of mind, which I think is a really great way of describing it, is sort of shocking. Um, but I think true. So I didn't bring you the the passages in Held that do some of the same kinds of stuff because the nodding pa noddings passages are a little juicier. But there's a very similar set of set of things going on, and part of what is going on for the analytic, the like Anglophone philosophy people, is there's a long history of critiquing deontology even before we get to the 80s. Um, so even like if in analytic philosophy, if you go back to someone like Elizabeth Anscombe in the 50s, she is doing that and doing it in really religious terms. So she thinks there's like a, a Hebrew Christian ethic that is underlying all these notions of obligation and we have to get rid of that. 
um, and replace it with something else. But there's no like Jewish Christian split that's legible in that tradition. So part of what I'm trying to do in, in this work and also in, in some of my work on virtue ethics is just to show that the, the Jewish Christian difference is actually doing a lot of work, um, even if you don't always see it on the page. So I think that that intuition is totally right. When we get to the Jewish piece of the story, philosophical story, it gets even more kind of complicated because there's the figures that Benjamin is critiquing in the obligated self. So Cohen, Levinas, Buber, Rosenzweig, that whole crew think that they are going into the philosophical tradition and ridding it of these Christian habits of mind that they think are kind of limiting it in problematic ways. And they have different ideas about how they're going to do that, but they're basically all in a certain way trying to find a way to talk about that. And Benjamin thinks that in part because of the kind of masculine nature of the way they go about things, right, or even kind of the misogynistic nature in which they go about things, they fail to achieve the goals that they set out to achieve. And she doesn't frame it as failing to reject a Christian framework, um, but I think that's what it is in a lot of ways. Um, that they, they are not able to kind of totally think their way out of the box because, um, because they're holding on to these notions of abstract personhood that you know come in into vogue in the enlightenment and stuff like that. And Right, and even I would say it's even earlier because it 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 is even that uh, you know a sort of a, a very Christian, um, I mean Paulinian really um, hierarchy of carnality and of uh, right in in, mm -hmm. in in that mm -hmm. way. So both women and Jews become these kind of symbols of carnality, and and it seems like your your characters are even though they might be Jewish they are in fact uh, uh, you know um, absorbing that framework that gendered framework in that way. yeah I think they absorb that gendered framework and there is a way in which even Benjamin I think to a certain extent thinks that if we just got the embodied part right mm -hmm. and we sort of right like if Paul is if the sort of Paulinian thing is to say well there's a, there's a a feminine embodied thing and then there's an abstract thing and you know in certain ways we like the abstract thing better and in certain ways we like the embodied thing better and we're, we're not enthused generally about the feminine thing um right that if we got if we just brought the embodiment back in we'd be done right we'd, we'd, yeah, we'd have yeah. solved the problems and part of what i'm trying to argue is that's only half the story because there's a way in which actually abstraction is really crucial to even the embodied experiences, even the, the women's experiences that we're not, that, and that every time we try to talk about them, um, we need to, we need to, to be able to, to apply abstraction. Mm -hmm. and, and ethics lends itself to embodiment, right? I'm, I'm going to um, now turn to some of the questions from the audience. So uh, following up on our discussion, it seems to me uh, one of the uh, one of the attendees says it seems to me that the notion of faith was negated or neglected generally in this philosophical discussion, both regarding people of faith and people uh, people's communities of faith. How do you reconcile faith and faith and philosophy in this context? Um, okay, so I'm afraid I'm not going to solve the great faith and philosophy problem in the next three minutes, um, but I I think there are a few things going on that are worth noting. The first is in Held and Noddings, especially Noddings, Noddings has no patience for religion at all. And no patience, and she has a, she's interested in a notion of faith. Um, faith is better than rules, but religion is not good. So she's even got an amazing- But it's a religious framework, right? But it's a religious framework, right? Well, so this is what's so infuriating about it as a scholar of religion. You come in and you're like, wait, but your secular paradigm isn't so secular. Oh no, you know, that, that yeah, it's a religious framework. And so she has these amazing passages where she says like, you know, there are these women who want more roles in religious communities. And like, why do they want to put on all this patriarchal ceremonial garb and like hand out, you know, hand out blessings onto the people? That's a crazy thing, uh, a, a, a crazy thing to say. Um, and so 
there's a way in which this tradition, the Carothical tradition is interested in faith as a category, but not that interested in religion and therefore really disturbed by religious communities. Nell Nonnings has no patience for institutions generally, right? She thinks they're problematic. So, you know, that's gonna get, get you, it's gonna limit what kinds of religious communities you can, you can be involved in in a lot of ways um, in her framework. That being said, there has been in the past 15, 20 years, um, maybe even less, 10 years, uh, a real interest in religious ethics in talking about care. So I brought you the, the Jewish studies stuff, but there's a parallel literature going on in Christian thought that's also really interested in ethics of care for, for kind of different reasons, less interested in obligation, often more interested in, you know, uh, other kinds of Christian categories associated with care. Um, so even though these core texts are sort of anxious about religion, it's nonetheless the case that um, a lot of scholars see care ethics as a useful tool for analyzing, um, analyzing what religion is, what religion asks of us. Mm -hmm. And I think they're kind of right in a lot of ways that religion often asks about how we live with other people and how we deal with them in their, their vulnerability and their need. And to that extent, religion or something like it is playing a really big role. Um, so it's both the case that, uh, yeah, faith plays a complicated role here, but religious community becomes really important. So I, um, uh, we were talking about the gender and, and Jewish uh, sort of uh, undermining some of these, uh, some of those assumptions that we were talking about. Um, so uh, the question, uh, one of the questions is, uh, what do you think uh, is the queer contribution to this discussion? Yeah, um, so I, I have sort of two answers. One answer is Benjamin's book in a certain way is an attempt at that. And it's an attempt at that from, from an autobiographical place. Um, and it's in a lot of ways trying to talk about how you know, the versions of, she doesn't, she doesn't do it super critically, but it's, it's there and it's sort of present um, that care can be sort of differently construed and doesn't have to be biological, right? And once you get there, you can do other things. Um, but I think other queer scholars are doing really interesting work on this. So um, I heard a paper at the Society for Jewish Ethics conference a couple, like a month and a half ago, um, trying to use Benjamin's framework of care to talk about queer chosen family. So mm -hmm. there's that kind of work that I think still is very new right now and needs is really urgent and needs to be done. Um, but I think one of the kind of primary things that that queer scholarship can do is come in and, and give us another good reason to reject the assumption that care is characterized by biological relationships as opposed to chosen family or something like it. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but there, you know, there is a, a comment questions about Lori Zolos and, and her approach. And I don't know whether you want to comment uh, about her um, ap application of some of these theoretical concepts to bioethics. And, and you are familiar with that. Um, uh, are you familiar with yeah, um, yeah, I am familiar with with Lori's work, and also um, I've had the opportunity to to share many many rounds of the Society for Jewish Ethics conference with with Lori. And I think yeah, there's a way in which she her earlier work sets up some of what is made possible in in Benjamin, um, even if it's often kind of you know she's mm -hmm. she's a bioethicist in a lot of ways and is answering mm -hmm. kind of narrower questions, um, but a lot of the work that she does sets up. Mm -hmm. the analysis that that Benjamin does so she's sort of a foundational figure in the in the tradition but I think there's one there is an important kind of little historical wrinkle here that's worth pulling out um bioethics as a field and and Jewish thought or Jewish ethics are not totally are, are a Venn diagram but they're not totally overlapping um, and Benjamin is not coming at her questions from a bioethical place. And I'm really not interested in, in coming at like infertility from a bioethical place. So a lot of what's been written about Judaism and infertility tends to be about questions like, you know, is X and Y kind of medical treatment permissible or impermissible, either according to halakha or according to some broader ethical framework. 
And that's a really important set of analyses to engage in. Um, but it's not the question I'm most interested in answering. The question I'm most interested in answering is how does how do experiences of infertility like shape subjects, shape communities? And how do Jewish texts help us think about that shaping? And, um, and I, a I, I, different question. Yeah, and I would like to end with a, a final question on um, how are, you know, are these scholars like you, um, actually engaging with each other or they are just talking to their respective communities uh, and uh, you know and therefore contributing really to that idea that there is this universal you know great universal and then there are these particular groups that are engaged in their philosophical kind of uh, 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 debates yeah I think the answer is some of both so I think in a way like we there there is a good you know, growing scholarly conversation about gender and Jewish thought and associated issues. And I think I sort of hinted at it at the beginning, but there's sort of a turn in the field in the past five, six years. Um, so that's happening. To what extent we're talking to a broader philosophical audience? I hope we will be, but I think that work is still to be done because um, I live at the on the border of a religious studies department and a philosophy department. I'm always talking to different audiences and especially the religious piece is new, but I think even philosophers in the broader kind of Anglophone moral philosophy world right now are not talking about care quite as much as Jewish studies people are talking about care. Um, and I think probably they ought to be talking about care more so we can, that's something that we can kind of remind them of and, and talk about in a new way by bringing some of our tools to analyze the kind of historical religious, uh, you know, Jewish Christian divides that that mm -hmm. uh, that I was talking about earlier. Thank you so much. I'm uh, sorry we didn't get to all your questions. We will convey them to to Sarah. Sarah, thank you so much, and I hope you'll join us uh, next week uh, and week after for our other events. So thank you uh, again and uh, for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>